Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I want to get your attention and introduce our historian today, John Horrigan, who's here for a second time. And he's going to be speaking about Bay State phantoms and monsters. So this should be very interesting and appropriate for the season. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chris. Well, good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Um, today's lecture is Bay State Phantoms, and my name's John Horrigan. I'm the host of a television show uh, called The Folklorist that uh, won nine Emmy Awards over the course of its run from 2012 through 2016. It's no longer in production. And I'm also um, an ad hoc itinerant professional sports announcer, having worked with the Boston Bruins alumni. Um, this is my officially with the alumni 15 years, but I've been a professional hockey announcer for 25 years. And also uh, working, I worked uh, with the uh, Boston, the New England Patriots alumni as well as their basketball announcer. You may have seen some of the games in the area. And I had a chance to call a Red Sox game at Fenway Park on June 5th, 2012 against the Baltimore Orioles. So and I do comedy basketball as well, having worked with the Harlem Wizards, the Harlem Rockets, the Harlem Magicians, the Harlem Hoopsters, and the Court Jesters. Also a historian. Originally from Dedham, Mass. I uh, grew up in Dedham, then moved to Watertown. I currently live in Waltham. I'm a member of the Historical Society of Watertown, the Waltham Historical Society. And uh, I also belong to the Society in Dedham for the Apprehension of Horse Thieves. In, in over 200 years of existence, the Society has apprehended, uh, they've never apprehended a horse thief. But they hold a great annual banquet. So. I'm also an economic historian as well, a former c colonial reenactor with the Lincoln Minutemen. Um, when you walk in period clothing for several miles and you have plantar fasciitis, carpal tunnel, and you spill um, black powder on the carpet, you tend to retire early and I'm no longer a member of them. And then I portrayed uh, Alexander Hamilton for a reenactors collaborative known as Solo Together. And I have over 100 lectures in my portfolio. As Chris mentioned, um, I do various things from historical weather to disaster stories, war stories, biographies, hero stories, the unexplained, and that's what we're talking about today. I've been called many things, some that I cannot mention in public, but uh, the pocket historian is a moniker. And I know that we have folks here that may know more about the subject than I do, but we ask that you hold your questions until the conclusion of the lecture. That way, with your direct questions, I can provide evasive answers. So today we're going to look at the definition of a phantom or a monster that could include alleged creatures. Now it's up to you to determine personally whether you believe in these or not. I like to quote, quote author and UFOlogist Jacques Vallée who said that we have to understand that we may not be able to understand as human beings. But today's uh, story will include stories of sea monsters, hairy man beast anthropoids aka Bigfoot, strange lights, ghosts, oop animals, out of place animals, real animals, etc. We're going to learn about what is known as the Bridgewater Triangle and then look at a survey of New England legends uh, beginning in 1638 through um, this current decade. And then a monster. What's a monster? Well, it's a legendary animal combining features of animal and human form or having the forms of various animals in combination as a centaur, griffin, and sphinx. And I often like to tell people that there are a lot of Bigfoot reportings throughout North America, especially in Canada and the Pacific Northwest. But rarely do you hear people reporting seeing a griffin, a centaur, or a sphinx. They always seem to these, be these upright bipedal gorillas. Monster is also any creature so ugly or monstrous as to frighten people, or any animal or human grotesquely deviating from the normal shape, behavior, or character. It's a person who excites horror by wickedness and cruelty, also, monster can mean huge, enormous, monstrous. Now, what's a phantom? Well, a phantom is an apparition or a specter, an appearance or illusion without material or substance, as a dream, image, mirage, or optical illusion, a person or thing of merely illusory power and status, as i.e., the phantom of fear, and then of pertaining to or of the nature of a phantom, illusory, like a phantom sea serpent. Now, you've all heard of the Bermuda Triangle, I imagine, which is supposedly in the Sargasso Sea off the coast of Florida, where ships and, uh, have disappeared and planes have disappeared and uh, you have magnetic anomalies with the, uh, the compass. Well, there's 
Over a dozen alleged paranormal triangles worldwide, including the Dragon's Triangle off the coast of Japan, the Great Lakes Triangle, if you talk to people in the Great Lakes. Well, how many people knew that we have an alleged uh, uh, anomalous triangle known as the Bridgewater Triangle in Massachusetts? And this logo, created by my wife, uh, <laughs> allegedly in this area, they've seen black dogs, huge black dogs, Bigfoot, Thunderbirds, which are gigantic birds, giant snakes, phantom pumas or cougars, and ghosts and UFOs. Now, allegedly, this area is about 200 square miles with the apex of the Bridgewater Triangle in Abington, Massachusetts, the lower southeast uh, angle of the triangle in Freetown, Massachusetts, and the lower southwest corner of the triangle in Rehoboth on the uh, Massachusetts-Rhode Island line. And within this area, there's a place known as the Hockamock Swamp, which you can get there off of 24 or Route 138. And it's about 5,200 acres, and we'll talk about this in a second, of uh, forbidding territory. But within the Bridgewater Triangle, there's been all sorts of incidents. At Stonehill College, for instance, and this is a graphic courtesy of the Boston Globe, people have reported hearing a little girl crying and laughing and footsteps in a gym that was built on the former site of a pool where allegedly the daughter of the school's president drowned. We'll talk about this, a red-headed hitchhiker. I'll talk about that at the conclusion. An alleged phantom hitchhiker that you pick up and then you look over your shoulder and he's gone. We'll look at a haunted schoolhouse from the 19th century, a single-room schoolhouse in Rehoboth, known as Hornbine School. We'll look at Taunton State Hospital, where visitors have reported feeling their shoulders touched and their legs pulled when entering sections of the hospital, and it was allegedly used in the 1960s and 70s by satanic cults. We'll also look at the Asonet Ledge in Freetown State Forest, where visitors have reported seeing ghosts standing on the ledge or jumping off of the ledge and then disappearing. And finally, we'll look at Copacut Road. Travelers have reported a truck driver following them closely, flashing his lights, honking his horn, and making all sorts of wild motions with his arms. And then the truck disappears. Now, I think I've solved that problem. I think that's a FedEx driver who's laid on this route. <laughs> So I, I mentioned Hockamock Swamp, 5,200 acres. It's the alleged site, or it is the site, of the King Philip's War from 1675 through 1676, the first major conflict between Anglo-Saxon settlers and the Native American inhabitants, uh, if you discount the Pequot War, which took place in this area in Norfolk, Mass. Um, the, in the Hockamock Swamp, there's all sorts of strange places, including a rock where allegedly um, a Wampanoag sachem or chief um, died. But these are the places that I was talking to you about. This is Taunton Hospital, which allegedly is haunted. This is a sonnet ledge where people allegedly have seen people jumping off into and then disappearing into the water. This is the single schoolhouse known as Hornbine School, where alleged witnesses have, have said that they've seen they peered in, in in the late 1980s and saw some sort of school teacher in 19th century dress lecturing to students who also appeared to be wearing the garb of 19th century students. And then this is Profile Rock, which uh, allegedly is the um, profile of Massasoit. I produced a CD called Mysterious Bridgewater Triangle in 2006 that featured Christopher Balzano and Chris Pittman. I had 5,000 CDs made, and in 10 years I've sold 12 CDs. <laughs> That's right, and my wife says, what are you gonna do with those? All right, let's take this uh, a Bridgewater Triangle documentary produced by Man Manny Familari and um, Aaron Kadju. I uh, got a chance to do the voiceover for it in 2013. So here, and they appeared on Chronicle, so let's just take a look at this video. This is Chronicle on WCBB Channel 5. In the Hockamock Swamp, hikers get a little hinky. An eerie, unearthly feeling of being washed. It makes them very uncomfortable. On the trail of a story, reporters get into the headlines. I noticed this really bright light over the tree line. Strange doings explored in a new film, The Bridgewater Triangle.
Plus, they called it the rat. All oh, my rock and roll dreams came true there. When Kenmore Square was scruffy, it was the place to be. You felt like a rock star if you were on stage, even if there were only three people in the audience. Punk days and paranormal nights. It's Indie Showcase, next on Chronicle. Good evening. Tonight we enter a place where paranormal is normal and skeptics become believers. At least that's the story of a new documentary, The Bridgewater Triangle. It focuses on a part of southeastern Massachusetts that is reportedly home to legends and mysteries. One particular spot of interest, the Hockamock Swamp. John Horrigan is the film's narrator. At the epicenter of the Bridgewater Triangle is a 17,000 acre tract of densely wooded wetlands known as the Hockamock Swamp. It's a massive wilderness area and most of the most compelling and the most consistent stories come from the Hockamock Swamp area. The swamp extends into several towns including Bridgewater, Easton, Raynham, Taunton, West Bridgewater and parts of Norton. The Hockamock serves as both a wildlife management area and as an important water source for the surrounding communities. In addition to its environmental importance, the swamp plays a significant role in Native American history. The word Hockamock originates from the Algonquin word, meaning place where spirits dwell. We know that there are at least 1,000 graves out there that are 8,000 plus years old. And we also know that it's been sacred to the Native Americans for at least that time. In fact, they remember a time when it was actually a glacier, which is when the swamp itself becomes the swamp. This was a place where they could hunt and fish and also be protected from other tribes. After the outbreak of King Philip's War, the swamp was used as a hiding place for the Native population. The dark and ominous wetlands served as the perfect staging ground for native raids against nearby European settlements. If you know the swamp, you have a big tactical advantage over someone who, who doesn't. Largely viewed as the beating heart of the Bridgewater Triangle, the Hockamock Swamp has seen more than its share of alleged strange occurrences. You know, when you're talking about legends and the paranormal, it's got to be the right setting. You are probably never going to make a documentary about a haunted McDonald's. It's just the wrong setting. It could be the most haunted place on earth, but it's not the right context for people to understand and appreciate a ghostly legend. The Hockamock Swamp is, it's the right setting. The best evidence that there's something very unusual happening is the consistent and constant reports from people who have been in the Hockamock Swamp and reported an eerie, unearthly feeling of being watched. It makes them very uncomfortable. It's something that can be startling even to experienced people in the wilderness, hunters, trappers, and outdoorsmen. The Hockamock Swamp has long been the focus of cryptozoologists or those who study the existence of cryptic animals. Ape-like bipeds, enormous birds, snakes the size of stovepipes, giant cats, and ravenous red-eyed dogs have all been reported, both within the remote swampland and in the swamp's surrounding communities. Renowned cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman has been researching and investigating cryptozoological mysteries since 1960. One of the world's foremost leaders in the field Coleman has written extensively about cryptic animal encounters from all corners of the globe. In 1975, I moved from California to Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I started picking up on this whole notion that there was an area in southeast Massachusetts that almost was a magnet of weird phenomena. And because of the three bridge waters, there was already a hint that there was a triangle in the area. And I started looking and plotting different sightings, different incidents on a map, and really noticed it was a triangle. In 1983, Coleman published his most famous work, Mysterious America. In a chapter detailing his findings in southeastern Massachusetts, Coleman dubbed the region the Bridgewater Triangle. In 2003, Coleman opened the International Cryptozoology Museum, the attraction houses thousands of artifacts relating to cryptic animals, including plaster casts of alleged Bigfoot prints. Located at 11 Avon Street in Portland, Maine, the museum is open to the general public. And we actually know someone who had a rather unusual experience in that area. A veteran reporter finds a story he can't explain. It looked like a baseball home plate. It was kept coming and coming and coming. 
So that's an overview of the Bridgewater Triangle. And again, the term Bridgewater Triangle was coined by Lauren Coleman, who wrote a tremendous book called Mysterious America in 1983. And, and I, I remember reading that in the mid-80s and saying, oh, this is interesting. The Cape Ann Sea Monster, 1638. This report is filed by John Jocelyn in the year 1638. Now, today we are on the Gregorian calendar, right? We had to shift over from the Julian calendar, uh, which was about a year's difference, in the United States in 1752. So technically and historically, September 1st, 1752 in the United States is followed by September 14th, 1752 to make up that la lapse time. But anyways, we believe this is 1638 or 1639. And he says, and of course it's in the lexicon of 17th century New England um, settlers. They told me of a sea serpent or snake that lay coiled up like a cable upon the rock at Cape Ann. A boat passing by with English on board and two Indians, they would have shot the serpent, but the Indians dissuaded them, saying that if he were not killed outright, they would all be in danger of their lives. Now keep in mind, these were settlers that came to the, uh, the New World and settled in New England. They lived on the coast. They were familiar with the fauna and the animals that occupied the ocean, and it came into their harbors and bays. They knew what a whale was. They knew what an eel was, a sea turtle, and the various types of fish. So when they describe something serpentine in nature that looks almost like a giant snake or dragon-like creature, it makes you say, hmm. In fact, the first UFO sighting ever recorded, we call it the Great Light in the Night, and again, this came to our attention through John Winthrop, the uh, early governor of Massachusetts, when he wrote the history of New England from 1630 to 1639. And what he said, basically about this great white light in the night, it was originally reported that on a night in March of 1638 or 1639, taking in that calendar shift consideration, James Everill, who was known to be a sober and discreet man, according to Winthrop, along with two companions, boarded a little boat and set out for a trip on the Muddy River in Boston. The Muddy River is an estuary of the Mystic River. They had been moving downstream for about a mile when the three men were suddenly confronted with the appearance of a huge bright light hovering in the sky that, quote, flamed up as it hovered and appeared to be about three yards square. The light contracted into the figure of a swine. Now, these were farmers, and they could only correlate this or associate this with a familiar figure, so they used a pig. <laughs> and it moved swift as an arrow in the direction of Charlton. They mean Charlestown here, but they used to call it Charlestown, Charlton. Moving back and forth for about two to three hours. When the light finally disappeared, the men noticed to their dismay that they had somehow been carried against the tide back to the place where they had started their trip. Governor Winthrop also noted, noted that diverse or various other credible persons also saw the same light after in about the same place. Now some claim that the, UFO, the light was shooting off flames and sparks, and indeed two UFOs matching that description were again seen in Boston in the year 1644. <coughs> now some people have said, is this a missing time experience? People who have claimed to have been abducted by aliens claim that time goes missing, that they were in their car and all of a sudden they, they're back in their car and they're seeing this light shoot away and it's four hours later. But I think what happened with these two gentlemen, they were so mesmerized by whatever this light was, it certainly isn't any sort of astronomical phenomena in terms of a bolide, a meteorite, because it hovered, it stopped short, and then it was in the sky for two to three hours. But they were so mesmerized, they lost track of time, and they drifted downstream back to the place where they had started. So it certainly is um, an odd encounter. 1641 in Lynn. And this is a... Uh, uh, an account that comes to us from Obadiah Turner. And he says, and I apologize again for the vernacular of the 17th century, but there's a lot of yees in here. Some being on ye great beach gathering of calms and seaweed, which had been cast thereon by ye mighty storm, it was, this is after a storm, and the, there's still a lot of frothy surf, did spy a most wonderful serpent a short way off from ye shore. He was big round in ye thickest part as a wine pipe, and they do affirm that he was 15 fathoms, which is 90 feet, or more in length. A most wonderful tale, but ye witnesses be credible, and it would be of no account to them to tell an untrue tale. So again, this is something they're familiar with it, and 
several people claiming that they're seeing this 90-foot-long sea serpent or serpentine anomaly. Now, the Specter Leaguers. What's going on in Massachusetts in 1692? What type of hysteria? Witchcraft. Yeah, that's correct. The witchcraft trials, right? The Paris girls, who I call the first American actresses. You know, we're, we're having these fits and spells, and we'll see another story later about that. Everybody was accusing everybody else of being a witch. In fact, uh, it was Giles Corey was pressed, where laid down, they put a board on him, and everybody came in and put a huge rock in his chest till he was crushed. And I think it was all, it was finally thwarted after the governor's wife was accused of being a witch, and that's it, no more witches. <laughs> so, same year though, 1692. It's the summer of 1692, and a man by the name of Ebenezer Bab Babson of Cape Ann, with the rest of his family, almost every night heard noises as if some persons or people were walking or running around their house. He came home one, late one night, and he saw two men come out of his house. And at the sight of them, they ran swiftly from the end of the house into the adjoining cornfields. Going in, he immediately questioned his family concerning these strange visitors, and they promptly replied that no one at all had been there during his absence. Expecting an immediate attack by Native Americans, the whole family went in haste to the nearest garrison or fort. They had only just entered the fort when they heard heavy footfalls, as if a number of men were trampling on the ground around it. They surrounded one entity that Babson shot at point-blank range, and they saw him drop. A search was made, but the dead body vanished. The posse of colonists heard loud, unintelligible babbling from the swamp. And after searching in vain, they returned to their garrison. There they saw more men skulking around the bushes, who prudently kept out of gun range. In the next few days, two from the garrison saw 11 men come out of an orchard in which they seemed to do, be performing some strange incantations. Richard Dolliver then raised his musket and fired into the midst of them without any effect. The invaders showed themselves first in one place and then in another, seeming to be lurking in every bush. Though repeatedly shot at, none could be killed. The specters threw stones, beat upon barns with clubs and otherwise. Then it stopped, and the case was never solved. Specter leaguers. Now, Anawan Rock. This is off of Route 44 in Rehoboth. If you ever wanted to visit it, you have to keep your eyes peeled as you're coming from moving um, west. It's going to be on your left. It was the death of King Philip, who was a sachem or chief of the Wampanoag Indians. And people have reported at Anawan Rock, hearing the voices of what, sounds to be, uh, what seems to be a Native American tongue. And people have also reported the sound of arrows whizzing by their head. People have reported seeing and smelling phantom campfires at the top of Anawan Rock. And also... Um, this is the site where King Philip, who was the successor to uh, King, um, I'm sorry, yeah, the death of, this is where King Philip was killed, and uh, he was surrounded by noted uh, uh, Native American killer Benjamin Church, and this is the site of his death as well. So they feel that this is haunted. Other people have smelled phantom campfires and the like. Now people aren't familiar, but in this area, um, large bears were indigenous to this area mainly black bears, and also wolves. Now, wolves were on the brink of extinction over the past decade. They've been brought back in numbers, especially in the high plains and in the, in the west and in some of our national parks. But there was a wolf problem in 1704 in Newburyport. Wolves were attacking livestock, pigs, sheep, cows. So the actual, the town's, uh, the town's um, uh, leaders decided to put out a bounty or a reward for anybody that killed a wolf in Newbury in 1704. Nobody ever retrieved that. But just a few years later, about 1752, in Le Jovedan, France, there was an outbreak of wolf killings where wolves were attacking people in this village. It's called the, the Beast of Le Jovedan, if you ever want to look it up. But wolves were certainly prevalent, and you'll see one come back later in our story. But um, it's the town, they did kill two wolves on Plum Island. Um, but again, they were a threat to the sheep, and I, I don't know if you've heard about the coyote populations that are real. I remember going down to, to see my dad in, in um, Marshfield. 
and he's sitting on the porch. He says, you got to see this photograph of a coyote that I took. And then he's, he's open, showing him. And as I'm looking at it, the co another coyote is walking down the road. It's like, okay. So, again, they're scavengers. And... Now, the White Witch of Littleton. In 1720, Mrs. Dudley, who was the wife of Littleton's first town clerk and selectman, was being harassed by three young local girls. They were sisters who would go into fits whenever she was around. This, by the way, was exactly the same practice that was used by the Paris girls in Salem, Massachusetts during the witch witchcraft hysteria in 1692. And their behavior and accus accusations of bewitchments instigated the Salem witch trials and the eventual ex executions that followed. So true to form, the three Littleton girls asserted that Mrs. Dudley was bewitching them and was the cause of their apparent fits and predicaments as well. They also claimed that she could make the earth shake. No formal accusations were ever lodged, and Mrs. Dudley died shortly thereafter after giving birth to her 13th child. Bless her soul. <laughs> now, I've been a researcher of old New England earthquakes, and um, I've worked with the, um, uh, with the director there at Western Observatory, run, run by Boston College, and it reveals that there were some minor tremors, ironically, in the Littleton area in 1720. So I'm wondering if half of that story is true, that Mrs. Dudley wasn't, wasn't a witch. She didn't make the earth shake. The earthquakes did. Now, the Gloucester Sea Serpent. Now, here's a, a, a puzzler. From 1817 through 1819, the largest commercial port in the United States after the War of 1812 was Gloucester, Mass. Seasoned mariners coming in from all parts of the world via the Atlantic Ocean. And a lot of people were familiar with the creatures that they saw not only close to the shore, but at deep sea, deep out in the sea. In August of 1817, two women claimed that they had seen a creature swimming into the harbor. It was seen at the same time by a ship's captain. And a few days later, Mrs. Amos Story said that she saw what appeared to be a tree trunk washed up on the rocks of Ten Pound Island, which lies in Gloucester Harbor. As she watched it through a telescope, it moved, and then when she looked again, it was gone. William Rowe reported seeing a creature saying that its head was as broad as a horse or more, but not quite as long. And then Mrs. Amos Story's husband, Amos Story, also reported seeing the creature. And he said, he continued in sight for an hour and a half, and his head appeared shaped much like that of a sea turtle. And he carried his head from 10 to 12 inches above the surface of the water. He moved very rapidly through the water, I should say a mile or two at most, in three minutes. I saw no bunches on his back. On this day, I did not see more than 10 or 12 feet of his body. And on August 12, shipmaster Solomon Allen said, his head formed something like the head of a rattlesnake, but nearly as large as the head of a horse. When he moved on the surface of the water, his motion was slow, at times playing in circles and sometimes moving straight forward. And then two days later, it was shot at by a ship's carpenter by the name of Matthew Gaffney. And he said, I had a good gun and took good aim. I aimed at his head, and I, I think I must have hit him, as he turned towards us immediately after I had fired. And I thought he was coming at us, but he sunk down and went directly under our boat and made his appearance at about 100 yards from where he sunk. This is a woodcut that was uh, an engraving that uh, had a, a caption that said, Taken from life as it appeared in Gloucester Harbor, August 23rd, 1817. So if you look at this, and again, these people were very familiar with um, sea life. In Gloucester, they were seasoned fishermen. And if you look at the scale of these longboats with people in them, as opposed to the Gloucester Sea Serpent, I mean, it's just, it's an enormous creature, so. So I'd like to play an episode, a segment from the folklorist. Throughout the centuries, tales of mysterious creatures of the deep have captivated the minds of countless people all over the world. Stories of Greek gods that prowl a watery hell, giant whales that ingest human flesh, and colossal squids that sink ships have ingrained a deep respect and fear within humans for these creatures of the sea. It was the year 1817 in the New England coastal fishing village of Gloucester, Massachusetts, where a series of strange sightings provoked a fearful outcry from residents who quickly realized that the harbor may be inhabited by a sea serpent. The hysteria began on August 6th, when two women were walking along the shoreline. They looked out towards the horizon and glimpsed an enormous figure swimming in the harbor. But this was no ordinary animal. 
It was a hideous, scaly, serpentine-like creature, nearly 100 feet in length. They watched it as it slithered under the waves, disappearing from sight. On that very same day, a seasoned captain noticed something while on the bridge of his ship. It was the same dragon-like figure peeking out from the water. And just as quickly as it appeared, the monster propelled itself down into the abyss. Later that day, when he recounted the sighting to his friends, he claimed it was full of joints and resembled a string of buoys on a net. Naturally, they ridiculed the man with hoots and wails of laughter, mocking his unbelievable story. This wasn't the first sighting of a sea serpent in Gloucester. In 1638, a ship passing through the harbor noticed something that laid coiled up like a cable upon the rock at Cape Ann. One settler aboard the boat was about to shoot at it, but was dissuaded by two Indians who said that if he didn't kill it outright, they would all be in danger of their lives. But unlike 1638, these sightings would occur more frequently. Just a few days later, Mrs. Story saw what appeared to be a tree trunk that washed up onto the rocks of a harbor island. What she saw was no tree trunk. Its dark body suddenly started to convulse, startling poor Mrs. Story. But when she regained her composure and gazed out again, the creature was gone. Even her husband claimed to have seen the beast a few days later. The creature moved very rapidly through the water, I should say a mile or two in three minutes. And more evidence surfaced when another resident, William Rowe, reported seeing a figure in the water that same day, claiming its head was as broad as a horse. Within the same week, on August 12th, a visibly shaken shipmaster, Solomon Allen, told some friends that he saw something like the head of a rattlesnake, but nearly as large as the head of a horse. When he moved on the surface of the water, his motion was slow at times, playing in circles, and sometimes moving straight forward. Some residents were beginning to get hostile towards this invasive sea demon. On August 14th, a ship carpenter named Matthew Gaffney caught sight of it from a boat and shot at it. He turned towards us immediately after I had fired, uh, and I thought he was coming at us, but he sunk down and he went directly under our boat. Residents were now at a point of hysteria as sea serpent fever swept across the town. Countless people made their way to the shoreline, hoping to catch a glimpse of the prehistoric monster. Even David Humphreys, a former aide to George Washington, visited Gloucester to interview witnesses who informed him that the serpent's features were much like the head of a turtle and larger than any head on any dog, with a 12-inch spear bulging from its skull. During that month of August, similar reports seemed to emerge daily from sailors, merchants, clergymen, people from all walks of life. Regardless of the accounts, the same question continued to arise. What was this beast lurking in the harbor? Was it a misidentification of some type of marine mammal? Or could it have been a dinosaur that survived extinction? Or was it simply a tale that had become more incredible with each retelling? Word had spread quickly, with the reports catching the attention of the Natural History Collective, the Linnaean Society of New England. And after a brief investigation, the Society published a pamphlet declaring that it was an entirely new genus known as Scoliophus atlanticus. They claimed that it was a breakthrough in the field of natural history. And there were even some reputable sources who came out in support of their alleged discovery. But newspapers viewed it as a sensationalized hoax meant to promote the city of Gloucester. And playwrights would ridicule the city with plays like Gloucester Hoax, a dramatic jeu d'esprit in three acts. By the end of the year, there had been 18 documented sightings of the creature. And while sea serpent fever has died down since 1817, there have been reports of denizens of the deep that have occasionally surfaced off the coast of New England. But whether these sightings were of a creature beyond belief, or if they were just a sensationalized interpretation by an excited town, the mystery of the Gloucester Sea Serpent still lingers to this day. There you go. So that's the Gloucester Sea Serpent. So the next one that we uh, want to talk about is the Powder Sare Star Jelly Angel Hair. It's this gelatinous substance that is usually equated with the appearance of a UFO. They call it star jelly. And in, in um, Lowell, on October 26, 1846, wow, almost uh, the anniversary is tomorrow, a large luminous flying disc reportedly dropped a lump of fetid smelling jelly, which is cobweb-like filaments that weighed 442 pounds and was four feet in diameter. <laughs> Clean that up. Now, have you heard about the lady in black? Uh, it's about Melanie Lanier and Samuel Lanier at Fort Warren and Colonel Dimmick. And here we go with the uh, Lady in Black. Mm -hmm. 
Some stories evolve into legends with details that are forgotten, misplaced, or embellished, taking a life of their own. One of those stories dates back to the 1860s when a tale of a young couple in love would come to a tragic end. The American Civil War is raging with hundreds of Confederate soldiers imprisoned within Fort Warren on Boston Harbor. According to legend, one prisoner, a young Lieutenant Andrew Lanier, had recently been married just weeks before his capture. Forced to live out his days in the corridor of dungeons, he was desperate to make contact with his beloved wife back home. Somehow he was able to send her a message, hoping that one day she would come to free him from his grim fate. Then, on a rainy night in January of 1862, his wife Melanie, dressed as a man and armed with a pistol, set out to free him. Upon landing at the fort, she managed to sneak by the sentries and slip into the corridor of dungeons. She whistles an obscure southern tune, which she knows only he would recognize. And there, standing in the shadows, was his long-lost love, holding the keys to his cell. I can't believe it's you! Hurry! Time is of the essence! The door swings open, and the two race down the hallway, but the commotion catches the attention of the guards, and Colonel Justin Dimmick is sent to investigate. As the couple rounded the corner, they were confronted by the Colonel. Stop where you are! A startled Melanie raises her gun and fires. She stands there in a daze. She sees her husband lying on the ground. Her gun had backfired. The shot she had intended to save her husband's life had taken it instead. Colonel Dimmick had no choice but to try her as a spy and a traitor, and he sentenced her to hang. And before her execution in February of 1862, Melanie had one final request, to be dressed in women's clothing. But all they could find for her to wear was a long black robe. Some people claim that a ghostly figure wearing a black robe haunts those who visit the fort. In the 1930s, when a soldier stationed at the fort was climbing down a ladder, he suddenly heard an ominous voice. Take me here. Many variations of the story have been told over the years, since folklorist Edward Rose Snow first popularized the tale in the early 20th century. Whether you believe the account to be fact or fiction, no one can deny the lasting legacy of the lady. In How many people have been to George's Island, Fort Warren? Uh, every, almost everybody. So. I saw the lady in black. Oh, oh. Well, you can't get away with just saying that. You have to tell me about your experience. When did you see it, Maybe. or her? Well, there's a narrow, narrow area that you can go, and everybody said it was there. So I, I assumed that that's what it was. Oh, okay. So somebody said that they saw it, and you were there when somebody said they saw it. Yeah. That's kind of like I, I know my cousins who has a friend, and his brother told me that. <laughs> I'm just saying, but it's but it. Anyway. I, I believe in ghosts. I just don't believe in ghost researchers, but, but that's just who I am. So, um, but no, the, yeah, there's been a legend about that. And of course, that was an active fort, not only during the American Civil War, um, but also during World War I to, to guard the uh, harbor. And people have reported seeing various images and sensations and a cold hand on their shoulders, etc. Now, how many people knew that we have a haunted tunnel known as the Hoosack Tunnel in the Berkshires? It's about five miles long and was took 25 years to build from 1851 through 1877. Now the term Hoosack means forbidden by local area Native Americans. In October 17, 7, 1867, an explosion killed 13 miners in the shaft and nearly 200 people lost their lives while working on the construction of the Hoosack Tunnel. And again, it, it was called the Bloody Pit. And locals in the area claim that strange winds, ghostly apparitions, and eerie voices are experienced within the tunnel. So let's just take a look at, once again, a segment from the folklore is called the Hoosack Tunnel. Since colonial times, America has sought to expand westward. But before creating a connection to the frontier, we would first have to construct a vast network of bridges, railroads, and tunnels across our nation's landscape. In the 19th century, the Hoosack Mountain in North Adams, Massachusetts, stood as a great natural barrier that limited commerce between the merchants and the western part of the state. In an effort to open more efficient and profitable trade routes, 
a plan for tunneling through the mountain to connect Boston and Albany by rail was proposed. On to Hoosac, on to the west. That was the rallying cry used by the Troy and Greenfield Railroad line. But the Hoosac Tunnel would soon become known as one of the most extensive engineering efforts ever undertaken, haunted by a series of unexplained events and terrible tragedies. From the very beginning, the project was beset with problems. It took years to acquire building permits. Rival railroads set out to stop its construction. And in 1851, after digging finally commenced for the unprecedented 4.7 mile long tunnel, the $25,000 custom made drilling machine had failed, getting stuck after cutting only 12 feet into the mountain. But supporters of the project would stop at nothing to break through the political red tape and logistical setbacks, and introduced the first commercial use of the dangerous and unstable explosive nitroglycerin. The project was once again underway, but now it was overdue, over budget, and increasingly unsafe. In 1865, explosive experts Ringo Kelly, Ned Brinkman, and Billy Nash were laying down the explosives to blast the rock from inside the mountain. Just prior to detonation, Nash and Brinkman were to seek shelter at a nearby safety point. But before they could reach it, Kelly detonated the nitroglycerin prematurely, and the two men were crushed under tons of rock. After the accident, Kelly disappeared and wasn't seen again until one year later, when a tunnel crew discovered his body in the exact same spot where the explosion had occurred the year before. Strangely, the coroner determined that Kelly's cause of death was strangulation and that it happened only a few hours before his body was found. The mystery surrounding his death caused ill ease among the miners, who reported hearing men's voices groaning in agony deep within the tunnel. The men began complaining, some refusing to work. The foreman told the workers, forget the noise, it's just the wind. But the complaints grew more frequent and workers started refusing to enter the tunnel after sundown. The foreman contacted a mechanical engineer, Paul Travers, and they traveled two miles into the tunnel to investigate. As they reached the spot, they stopped to listen. They stood in the cold silence and heard with their own ears what truly sounded like a man crying out in pain. Both men agreed that the sounds they heard that night could not have been the wind. One month later, disaster struck again, this time the worst in the tunnel's history. Thirteen men were working in the shaft in the middle of the mountain when suddenly fumes from a flammable lamp ignited, causing a massive explosion that rained down debris on the crew below. It took over a year to recover all of the bodies of the victims. During that time, villagers told tales of strange shapes and muffled wails coming from within the tunnel. Workers were said to have seen lost miners on the mountaintop carrying picks and shovels into a shroud of mist and snow. And after the final victim's body was buried, the sightings of the miners mysteriously ceased. In 1875, construction was finally completed and the tunnel had successfully linked trading to the west but the nearly 25-year, $21 million dig through the mountain had also claimed the lives of close to 200 men, earning it the name, The Bloody Pit. Some wonder if the tragedies and setbacks were a result of a curse from a mountain that would have been better left undisturbed, while others tell stories of strange sights and unsettling sounds that continue to haunt visitors to this day. I remember doing that and uh, my producers um, you know, were well into take 52 when they told me, I think we like take two the best. So, but holding up the kerosene lamp and breathing that in. So um, that's the haunted Hoosack Tunnel. Now, when you have a spate of unidentified flying object sightings, they call it a flap. There was a flap across the continental United States in late 1896 and 1897 that began in Sacramento, California and perpetuated its way across the country uh, to Chicago. Now keep in mind, this was the era of yellow journalism, which we've come back to here in the year 2017 with 
they called it fake news. Um, but uh, in 1908 and 1909, there was a scare ship um, flap that took place in Massachusetts. Keep in mind, the, Wrights, the Wright brothers flew in 1903. Count von Zeppelin did his first flying over Lake Constance in 1900. So for a craft to fly at high speeds with a very powerful, luminous light and uh, the ability to hover and then move very rapidly um, from a hovering uh, stance, they really didn't have the aeronautical technology back in 1908, 1909. So the story begins on Halloween, appropriately, 1908, two undertakers, appropriately, at three in the morning, appropriately, in Bridgewater, Mass, from the, appropriately, see these odd lights, and they see this hovering object with a bright light, and they're perplexed. They're the only two that witness it. It hovers, and it then moves to an, an area at, a, at an incredible rate of speed, un, unbeknownst to people in 1908, 1909. And keep in mind, this precedes World War I. And it goes off, they report their sighting, and then move forward in time in 1909, Christmas Eve, where they estimate 10,000 residents in Massachusetts in Natick, Wellesley, Newton, uh, Needham, uh, Randolph, all claim to have seen an odd anomalous light hovering in the sky. Again, uh, it was at night, seen by residents of East Boston even had seen it. Hovers in the sky and then flitters to another area in the sky shoots upward by hundreds of feet, then back down, and then scoots you know, to the east. And many people saw it. There were uh, many, many newspaper articles written um, throughout the Christmas season of 1909, and they call it the scare ship of 1909. Now, some of these sightings were attributed to an eccentric inventor by the name of Wallace Tillinghast, who had a clandestine laboratory in, deep in the woods of West Boylston, Mass., which is located out in the Worcester area. But they could never... Um, uh, wholly identify he as their perpetrator of this flying object, but it was the scare ships of 1908 and 1909. And there were other scare ship sightings that took place in 1911 and 1912 in Great Britain, 1914, etc. But it's one of those things that can't be explained that rests in the uh, newspapers. Back to a wolf, um, a, a collector of exotic animals um, in Massachusetts, and back then the licensing of, of caging and owning animals that weren't native to the area were lax because they were difficult to enforce. But it's 1913, April 10th, and a man who's ordered a wolf, a pet wolf, from Ohio. It's coming into Boston. Well, as soon as the train opens up its door to check the cargo, the wolf darts out and not its way through this wooden crate, sending commuters in a frenzy. They finally cornered the wolf and actually sedated it and brought it to the owner. But that was an urban wolf in 1913. One of the most famous UFO photographs ever taken took place in July of, 18, uh, of 1952. Now, 1952 in July especially was another UFO flap year. And in fact, UFOs were seen across the continental United States and some famous photographs were taken over the Capitol building of anomalous lights um, in, on successive Sundays in July of 1952. These are two Coast Guard men, Shell, Shell Alpert and Thomas Flaherty. And Shell was lying down in sick bay. It didn't feel that well when Thomas Flaherty said, Albert, come here, you got to see these lights. So he looked up in the sky, went back and got his Polaroid box camera and took this famous photograph near the Salem power plant. And we call them the Salem orbs taken in these four anomalous dots. And it went worldwide, or what we would call today in, um, in digital age, viral. Now in Marshfield, July 25th, 1962, 10 years later, um, and this is a personal account that I got. Um, friends, my friend's father, seen by a ship called the Carol Ann and a boat called the Vinci, it had the uh, head of an alligator and two large fins near its tail and the body of a nail ke keg. And Archie Lewis said, or should I say Archie Lewis said, it was gulping up the fish in the area and did not concern itself with the fishermen in any way. That's a direct quote. Yeah. <laughs> now, another... Um, UFO account was the Beverly Saucer Dance. This took place on April 22nd, 1966. And I've had people come to my lecture and said, I think I saw something strange in the sky about that time. But it was a UFO flap, an outbreak of sightings in the United States, especially in the Northeast, on April 22nd, 1966. And um, Nancy Maduno, age nine, in Beverly, was upstairs in her room while her dad watched TV downstairs. 
It was back to the aerials where you had to have, especially if you're watching 38 and you're watching the Bruins, you had to have the arrow just right, and if anybody moved, it would go out. So um, her, her mother, um, Claire, was playing bridge next door with her friends Barbara Smith and Brenda Maria. So Nancy looked out of her window and she, she saw this, these hovering lights, blue, green, and yellow, going slowly by her window. And she was terrified. She ran downstairs to tell her father, who was slapping the side of the TV with a cigar in his mouth, said, yeah, whatever, honey. And just then, her mother, Claire, comes in uh, with the two friends. They were going to order pizza to continue their bridge game. And that's when they, um, they said, what are you talking about? Well, we'll look outside. And they look outside the door and they see the hovering uh, blue, green, yellow lights. So they see it hover near the high school. And Brenda Maria, one of the friends, starts walking over, mesmerized, almost underneath it. And then all of a sudden, the objects seem to flash these brilliant lights. And as the story goes, Brenda Maria might have um, lost herself. Let's just say that, spoiled herself. So they call the police. The police come and say, okay, you probably saw a helicopter, ma'am. And, and yep, yep, we'll take down the report till they see it. And they get in their cruisers and they follow it down to Beverly High School. It's hovering over the high school and then the football field before it just shoots off at a tremendous rate of speed. Of course, the officers were subjected to scorn and ridicule by their fellow police officers, but they know what they saw, saw and they stood by their story. Which brings us to Bridgewater, April 1970. Residents of Bridgewater were reporting finding strange footprints in their gardens, which is coming through the winter, um, thaw, the winter thaw here in April, um, finding uh, uh, some of their gardens trampled on, uh, um, you know, ripe, unripe apples being bitten, uh, just all sorts of footprints. So they called the police. There was a, a, an outbreak one night in April of 1970. So the Bridgewater uh, police sent a cruiser down there and the officer is filling out his report form when suddenly he said, in something to this context, he said that something started lifting up the bumper of his cruiser up and down and he had his foot on the brake and he could see with the, the, in the gleam of the red taillights some sort of furry torso. Well, he throws on a searchlight and he described what he said, a bear running on two legs. And if it was a bear running on two legs, he probably would have said, hey, boo-boo, where's that picnic basket? So, <laughs> um, This one here, I remember as a little boy, even though you, you can tell that I'm only 26 years old. But 1970, I'm listening to the Bruins game on the radio with my brother. We had bunk beds, and they interrupted the broadcast to say that something had washed up on Mans Hill or Man Hill Beach, depending upon what part of the beach you're from, um, in November of 1970. It was 20 feet long and two tons. It caused a traffic jam in situate. In fact, some, uh, a restaurant was getting into the hysteria and was naming like sea, uh, sea monster chowder after it, not from here. But um, the thing st stunk to high heaven, and as you can see, it has a head here and some sort of dorsal fin and a tail that curls around 20 feet in length. This is folklorist Edward Rose Snow, who was a famous author and folklorist um, from the 1940s through the 1960s. In fact, he lived in uh, Marshfield Hills. And one time, uh, my aunt Kathleen told me that he was a Santa. He would fly and drop gifts from the air. And she stepped out of her door one day, and all of a sudden, boom, a gift came down. Edward Rose Snow. Um, so anyway, so the, I got a chance to actually handle a jar in formaldehyde of, of, of some tissue from this thing, allegedly, from David Downs, and I believe he was there that day. And the authorities said, they, they bulldozed this thing over because it stunk so bad, but they said it was a decaying masking shark. That is, that it lost its mouth, its dorsal fin, and it went from this shark here to here to here to this type of entity. So let's just see, what do you think? Is this a decaying masking shark? That? Is that? I don't think so. That? Nah. It's good. Something different from a decaying basking chair. I remember because we thought it was Puff the Magic Dragon, we thought it was. So. <laughs> Bridgewater Triangle, Birds Hill Thunderbird. Uh, Norton Police Sergeant Thomas Downey is driving through Easton on his way home to Mansfield, where he lived. And I, I lived a quarter mile from this area when I lived in Northeastern. And he's coming up in this area now, dubbed Bird's Hill, and he jams on his brake because this large, enormous bird landed in front of his, his car. It had a long beep, beak, red eyes, and a, a wingspan 10 to 12 feet in length. And when he got home and it just stayed there before it flapped its wings and flew off, he described it as what we know today as a prehistoric pterodactyl. Now, if you look throughout, there have been 
sporadic sightings of allegedly prehistoric birds that are somehow still in existence, whether in this plane of, of, of Earth or another. Um, in fact, some school teachers outside of Downey, Texas, in about, or Denton, Texas, about 1976, claimed that they saw one circling over their vehicle as they commuted to school. But, but it's, uh, they called him the Birdman, and when con I tried to contact him about 11 years ago, he was very upset that I found him, first of all, and, and refused to comment on it. Now, this is uh, what took place also in uh, 1976, I believe it was April, the Black Dog of Abington, and I told you at the beginning of the talk about the uh, top of the triangle is Abington Mass. Well, residents of Abington reported seeing a huge black dog with glowing red eyes. Um, it's, it began with firefighter Phil, Philip Kane, who said that he saw a black dog hovering that killed his two ponies, and one was gnawing out actually the throat of the pony. And finally, uh, a police officer by the name of Frank Kern was the last to encounter this. He had it cornered as it walked up onto a railroad track, and he said that he fired at it at close range, and the dog just looked at him and then ambled off down the embankment and off into the woods and off into folklore. Now, if you look at um, black dogs in literature, especially Victorian liter literature, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Hound of the Baskervilles, it's featured prominently. Black dogs with red eye are, yeah. eyes are supposedly portents of evil or death. So that's the black dog. And then the Dover Demon, which took place, I'm going to show you a video. This is 1977, school vacation, and I know we're running on time, so we'll see if this will bring us up and then I might wrap. In the tony town of Donor, Do what Dover, just up the road. Incredible. What if you saw something incredible, and others did too, but you just couldn't explain it, and you had no proof, and some people refused to believe you? Well, when a story lies between fact and fiction, it becomes folklore. And that's what happened to some high school kids on spring break in 1977 in the small affluent town of Dover, Massachusetts. 17-year-old Bill Bartlett went out for the evening with two of his high school buddies. As he drove along Farm Street with the music blaring, Bartlett noticed something moving along a stone wall at the edge of the road. There, he caught a glimpse of a creature with an unusually round head, long spindly arms and fingers, a pale complexion, and glowing orange eyes. He turned the music down. Did you guys see that? See what, Billy? That thing next to the road. His friends turned to look, but they saw nothing and convinced Bartlett to turn the car around to get a better look. But when they returned, whatever he saw was gone. A few hours later, 15-year-old John Baxter was walking down Miller's Hill Road, about a mile from Farm Street. As he strolled under a street light, he noticed a small person coming towards him. But upon closer look, it wasn't a person at all, and whatever it was, ran into the woods. John chased after it into an open field. There, peering into the darkness, he saw the same odd figure clutching a tree. It wasn't human, or like any animal he'd ever seen. Baxter hurried back to the road and ran straight home. He sketched what he had seen, and the image that he drew was very similar to the entity that Bill Bartlett claimed to have seen just a few hours earlier. Then, the following evening, young Abby Brabham and her boyfriend Will Tainter were driving along Springdale Avenue. Along the roadside, they saw a creature crawling on all fours with the same characteristics that Bill Bartlett and John Baxter had described, except that it had glowing green eyes. Once again, the elusive figure vanished before they could get a closer look. And that night, Abby made a sketch of her own. In the following days, word spread of the bizarre sightings, all within the same area. Reporters swarmed over the town seeking answers. Authorities vouched for the credibility of the young witnesses. But when the hype finally settled down, no one could provide a satisfactory explanation, and no definitive evidence ever surfaced. The creature was dubbed the Dover Demon by a young investigator named Lauren Coleman, and it hasn't been seen since. Its true identity still remains a mystery. But one thing is certain, all three witnesses made claims that were nearly identical, and to this day, they stand by their stories. So the Dover Demon, which took place on Vacation Week, 1977, um, what I didn't tell in the story, number one, Bill Bartlett, the first person that was seeing it, was driving his Volkswagen with two friends and they were, had the music blaring and they were smoking the wacky weed. Second of all, in the video, um, when we had Abby Brabham and Will Tainter sighting, 
the actress, Rachel, was the only one who had her driver's license, so we had to make her the driver, so it's not really real. So, Anyways, I want to wrap up my, my talk by t saying one thing to all of you here today on this Halloween season. Boo! <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah.